Hey folks, welcome back to another informational video with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Viking Age expansion for 878 Vikings, the invasions of England. Now, I would love to have the box here, and I'd love to be able to show you the box, but I foolishly and prematurely threw the box away because the expansion, all the modules that make it up, are easily fit into the base box of 878 Vikings. So I uh, let it go prematurely. Wasn't thinking, brain fart, I apologize. But we are going to get down to the table. I'm gonna show you what comes into the expansion. Now this is an informational video. It's not really a review. I just want to show you all of the different modules that come in this expansion so that you can make a better informed decision on whether or not you're gonna add this to your game. So let's get down to the table and get to it. So the first thing we want to show you, of course, is the book that comes in it, the rules for each of the different expansions that come in here. And of course, each uh, page is well illustrated, well worded uh, for the most part. And of course, and even on the back, it shows you all of the other things you can order for this. So you can further bling out your game. You can order giant maps. You can uh, uh, you can order uh, models for the uh, different um, Viking leaders that are out there. You can do building miniatures. So there's a lot of different things that you can do, but let's go ahead and take a look at each module. So the first module that comes in the box is the expansion called the War for Land and Gods. And what these do is it makes available to the English these church tiles, and it makes available to the Vikings these Viking fort uh, and Viking um, settlement tiles. They are double-sided, so each settlement has a fort on the other side of it, and so forth and so on. And then each church tile is also double-sided. You have the regular church here, and then on the other side, it has the uh, ruined or the plundered church. So basically, uh, to use this expansion, the English player is going to be taking seven church tiles and placing them on any city shires on the board. And then these uh, ten... Uh, Viking fort settlement tiles are going to be given to the Vikings. Uh, the way these work is that at the end of uh, a Viking faction's turn, they can uh, choose to remove any two Viking units from a city shire, or actually any shire, and they can place a Viking fort in that uh, shire. Now, there can only be one tile in the shire. Now, later on, on a future turn, they can choose to flip it over and turn it into a settlement, which basically means is that every reinforcement, they're going to be getting a... Um, they're going to be getting a, uh, a Norseman, and then during battles, this counts as a Berserker uh, in the battle, and it has to be uh, destroyed like a Berserker too. You can't control the Shire if there is a settlement in there uh, on the English side. So uh, that's a pretty neat thing uh, there. The church tiles, as soon as Viking players control a Shire with a church tile in it, the Vikings can plunder the church. And uh, that basically means they remove uh, the tile and give it to either English player and uh, plundered side up. Where a, the English are defending, they can take this plundered thing and remove it from the game, giving them a, uh, a commoner's card that they will be able to turn over and use those commoners in that battle. The second module is the Kingdoms module, which is uh, going to... Uh, give a special effect for whoever is in control of these different kingdoms. Uh, and control is determined by holding a number of shires in that region equal to the number of card, uh, the number here on this card, or more. So in East Anglia, if the English, which they do at the start of the game, hold at least two of the uh, shires in East Anglia, then they are going to be able to get this uh, ability. And of course, these start in the English uh, control, so uh, that's it. But if the Vikings ever come in and control two or more shires in this uh, East Anglia, then they're going to be given this card on the Viking side, which then gives them a special ability that they can carry out. For example, each Viking faction may hold a hand of four cards. Uh, when they gain East Anglia, each Viking faction immediately draws an additional card. If the Vikings 
lose East Anglia. They do not have to discard a card, but only draw back up to three at the end of their turn. So uh, East Anglia, if the Vikings control at least two Shires in East Anglia, they get to have an extra card in their hand. So that's pretty cool. So that's basically what the Kingdoms expansion does. It just gives an extra ability for controlling that kingdom. The King's module basically just gives each faction a uh, event card that is very powerful, but once it's used, it is discarded, so it's only one-time use. Uh, so, for example, we can go over, let's see here, King Edmund of East Anglia here. Uh, first of all, it tells you when the card can be played, uh, any battle phase. Uh, then it says, during all battles this turn, you must reroll all flea and command results once you do not re-roll a second time. So uh, this gives you a, a, an ability that you can re-roll those flea and command things. So you're really going to be looking for a lot of hits. Uh, if you look over here, King Berg, uh, Bergrid, I guess. Maybe I murdered that name. I apologize. It says, beginning at the uh, beginning of an enemy's movement phase is when you can play this event. It says, all enemy units must move from one shire of your choice to an adjacent empty or shire they, uh, com they control of their choice. Then you choose three shires. They may not enter this turn. The fourth module is the runes and prayer module, and basically it's these dice that uh, stand in for basically casting runes, as the uh, Viking seers used to do, to try to predict the future, uh, as they believed. And then there are prayer dice that come for the English, which uh, represent the prayers that they were lifting up to God in order to help them uh, stave off the Viking invasions. Uh, so basically, during battles, they can choose to roll these dice and then spend them uh, based upon whatever they would like to do. And each card, of course, lays out for you uh, what is required to trigger that effect. So, for example, if you have, if they have one rune available to them, Omens of Victory would trigger, which means, or they could choose to trigger this, which means that you could re-roll once any number of the Norsemen or Berserk battle dice if you wanted to use this. Uh, and once you used it, you could then uh, re-roll it on another uh, round of combat, if possible. Over here, there's uh, very basic sets. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just simply understand that uh, you're going to be able to try to affect different kinds of things during the battle. Uh, for example, uh, one of the um, uh, effects of the uh, Chris, uh, the English prayer is that you would replace one Norseman with a Thane unit. <laughs> That's interesting. If they were able to get three conversion uh, sites of both Vikings and English dice, uh, which is why it's kind of a push-your-luck mechanism, because you could be giving uh, uh, a, a very strong effect to the other side. For example, if there are three conversion tokens of either side, all Viking units must immediately move to an adjacent empty or friendly Shire. So again, you're kind of um, rolling the dice. The uh, push-your-luck mechanism on this side is martyrdom, uh, which is this face right here. English units ignore all command results on this battle dice roll. So uh, again, they're going to be staying in the fight and possibly being eliminated instead of being able to uh, regroup and uh, you know come back to fight another day. So the next module are the relics and holy sites uh, for each side respectively. The holy sites are going to be for the English player and then of course the uh, uh, relics are going to be used by the Viking player. Uh, basically, whenever a new leader comes out, he will be able to bring one of these chosen randomly into the fight and uh, or into the game, basically. And uh, it will carry an effect that will be positive for the Vikings. Sometimes, I believe, positive for the English if they capture it. But more often than not, not the... the bleh. But more often than not, the, the English player won't get any uh, benefit from having these things. Uh, the holy sites are very similar uh, to the relics in that uh, the English players are going to be able to place a number of these at the beginning of the game. And if the Viking player ever takes over that city shire and gains control of the holy site or the relic that is at the holy site, then they might be able to get another benefit during the battle. But there are some of these that don't affect 
effect. Uh, that the the Vikings don't get any positive effect from it. Uh, so again, this is almost kind of a um, adds a little bit of a oh, gee was a, a mystical flair to it, maybe a little bit, a little bit more of a fantastical uh, element to the game rather than just straight history. So it has its merit as well. Pretty neat. The Legends module enters into uh, the game these different kinds of control or uh, gold cards basically for vikings it has something like this viking nemesis uh five english units roll a flea or command result in a single battle dice roll includes feared units uh, so if this is ever in effect then they will be able to remove an additional uh, Viking uh, victory marker from the victory track. So uh, this is uh, uh, another way for you to take those things away, making it maybe easier for you to win the game. But on the other hand, the English Kings are also having their own goals and they're going to be able to place victory tr uh, track markers back on the victory track if these kinds of things are are entered in. So, uh, fared, uh, no fared or killed in a battle that begins with at least four units, four fared units. So there is that. Um, and if that ever happens, they can put it back as well. So these are different kinds of gold cards that you can put into the game. Uh, for example, another one, win a battle defending the last English controlled city shire in a kingdom. And if you win that battle, you get to place another victory port back on the track. So uh, there's a whole bunch of different things here which basically um, uh, could uh, make it either easier or maybe even a little bit harder for either side to win. The seventh module are the epic battle events and these are chosen, three of these are chosen at random and added into the fared deck and they are, um, if one is pulled, during a defending, an English defending a city shire, uh, then they apply their effects to both sides of that battle, and then an additional fared card is drawn for to see how many fared units join that uh, defense of a city shire. But generally speaking, just to give you an idea here, for example, Trader here says the attackers choose one of their factions as traitors to fight for the defenders. The defenders roll the traitor's battle dice and make decisions for them during this battle. Surviving traitor units are placed in the fled units area. So that is that takes place, that will affect, of course, both sides. Over here, war spreads. It says players may use command results to move into adjacent enemy shires. After this battle ends, battles in the adjacent shires are resolved in the order of the active faction's choice. So again, these are just kind of, uh, looks, sounds very, not whimsical, but uh, very uh, random type events. But again, only three of them are used uh, during the course of a game. So that's an interesting addition as well. The eighth module are Viking ships, which are represented by these little circular tokens uh, that will be used throughout the course of a game. Now, when a Viking leader invades a Shire for the first time, when he comes onto the board, uh, he places a uh, Viking ship token in that Shire. Now, <clears throat> uh, this makes the Shire Viking control, uh, much like uh, the reinforcements or the fort would be able to do. Additionally, um, uh, a Shire that has a Viking ship in it uh, will be able to be considered adjacent to another uh, Shire that has a, a Viking ship in it so that units can move back and forth between them as if they were adjacent. However, that cannot be used during a uh, with a control role during a battle to escape the battle. Uh, but it's also pretty cool. Now, when an English unit enters a Shire that has only a uh, Viking ship in it with no other units, it can burn the ship, which means that uh, at uh, which means that two units in the fled units area of the board uh, from a Viking faction must be removed if they're able to do that. Uh, but a burning ship is then removed from the board and then the English automatically would gain control of that Shire if, again, this was the only Viking unit in that Shire. 
And the final module is the Legendary Leaders module, which is shown here. Uh, Ragnar Lodbrok uh, is actually going to replace uh, Halfden's uh, great heathen host as the first invasion card for the Vikings, uh, the Norsemen. And uh, he comes with the ability that each command symbol rolled in battles equals a flea for the other side. So uh, that is um, a pretty nasty little combination, but he simply replaces the regular first invasion. Uh, then you have I, Lagertha. I don't know if I pronounced that correct. I, I apologize if, if, if I didn't. She can be basically added to any invasion uh, in the game, and she comes with two Norsemen and one uh, uh, Berserker, but any number of uh, models uh, from the other invasion card can be transferred over to her card during that invasion. The only thing is, is that she has to uh, invade from the same sea coast as the other leader. Now, she does count as a second army, so the movement card that you play in that leader phase has to be able to support two armies, so there is that caveat. But that's a powerful little addition that uh, can be added into your game. You can use one or both of these in your armies. So that's everything that you're going to be getting in the Viking Age expansion for 878 Vikings, the invasions of England. So uh, now I said this wasn't a review, but I will say this. I love it when games do this. I love it when uh, publishers make expansions to their games that are modular in effect. You don't have to use all of them. You don't have to use them together. You can piecemeal it. You can do whatever you'd like to. Uh, it makes the game feel more like a sandbox type environment that you can kind of custom uh, create each different game experience that uh, comes uh, in the expansion. I love it when they do that. So I will say that I do enjoy this expansion. I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, mince any words there, but the main thrust of this video is to simply show you what's there. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here at the end of the video jabbering on about the expansion. You know what's there. You know if you're going to enjoy it or not now. And so mission accomplished. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the flip side.